not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the apocalypse, brought to you by popular vote. Weapons such as racism, homophobia and sexism have been authorized for use. Government officials have been granted immunity and shall not be harmed, excluding those trying to make real change. Commencing at the siren, any and all abuse will be ignored for 12 continuous hours. Police, fire, and emergency medical services will be unavailable due to funding cuts. Blessed be our new founding fathers and mothers. A world reborn. May God be with you all. Margaret Atwood once wrote, Now I'm awake. I was asleep before. That's how we let it happen. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and suspended the Constitution, we didn't wake up then either. Nothing changes instantly. In a gradually heating bathtub, you'd be bowled to death before you even knew it. So now is the time to wake up because there won't be sirens calling for the end of days. We are already on our way. We just haven't realized it yet. So shout out to Cameron Rashid for this matrix style chair. Um, <laughs> I'm a therapist, so this is probably where I'm most comfortable. Um, I don't know any better than that, and I have broken it already. I've been here five seconds. It's all right, I'm just gonna be telling you stories anyway. So, growing up, I loved reading post-apocalyptic movies, and, sorry, reading movies, watching the books. That's the right way around, right? <laughs> now, Books like 1984, Hunger Games, Handmaid's Tales, stories about overcoming oppression and adversity, and maybe that was because I was trying to escape my own reality of post-September 11th fallout and Bradford race riots that were happening just outside my door. But ironically, looking back now, I feel like I was researching for the future that I'm now living in. Well, we used to call dystopia and speculative fiction is now called current events. And what many people don't know is that when Margaret Atwood wrote her tales about The Handmaid's Tale, she too had done her research and every atrocity and oppression faced by the men and women in that book had occurred at one time or in history. Now, we look back at history or look around the world with almost an air of arrogance. Well, if I was there, I would have. Bro, you would have done what? Posted it on Facebook, hashtag incent trending issue here just to get likes, please. Or the cries of politicians, this will never happen again. But time and time again, we find ourselves repeating the patterns and saying, I can't believe I still have to process this fucking shit. Sorry, mom. History is meant to teach us about learning from our mistakes. It's not meant to be a manual to repeat them. The fear is that in a hundred years, people will look back at our generation the way we talk about Nazi Germany. And for anyone in doubt, please remember that the Nazi party was um, legally voted in. Slavery was legal, as was segregation during the apartheid. So where are we now, living in a world of rising global populism? Populism being the political approach that seems to appear to appeal to the public and stands against the tyranny of the establishment, where people are hooked into, not on the basis of facts or research, but on what sounds good. Who's the biggest personality or who's got the best sub story? 
Basically, it's the political equivalent of the X Factor. The scary thing is, though, that most of the rhetoric produced by these new politics is often that one of hate. The logic being that for someone to be part of a group, you must be against and oppress another. Cries of anti-immigration, racism, closing of our borders, gender discrimination, homophobia, taking away of human rights, or even denying global warming. These discourses are polarizing and flooding the world. For example, after the Newspeak term of Brexit, Newspeak being from Orwell's 1984, where words are used ideologically, but no one really knows what they mean. Hate crimes went up by 41%. And crimes against Muslims went up by 326. Now, words have consequences. And the so so social, uh, social and political can affect the individual. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not for one second saying that everyone that voted for Trump and um, Brexit is racist, or that anyone who supported Hillary and Theresa May is a feminist, because that's exactly not what I'm saying. Standing for something doesn't mean you are that thing. Or against another. Footnote. Um, please await the latest updates for the states of Brexit and the collapsing government. This may actually be the apocalypse. So I think the vote's on at 7 o'clock tonight. I'm not sure. I'm also not here to say that populism itself is in itself the root of all evil. However, the discourses and rhetorics being used by, dare I say, some of the most popular current movements, they are dangerous and problematic. Where hate speech is glorified in a post-truth era where they reject facts and logic. Where emotive arguments, often dangerously so, appeal to the fear and hate within, which can be seen in the rise of hate crime across the world. Thus, as any other ideology, it can't go unquestioned and should be held to account. Now, for those of you who have come here today looking for answers, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, I have none. However, a wise man once wrote, people demand answers about the future, but if you understand the power of posing an interesting question as a means to gain deeper insight. And um, shout out to Imran Ali. Would you want to wave at me? Imran, has he gone? There you are. Hi, Imran. Um, Imran is one of the organizers. And yes, I Google stalked him to get the reference. Now, I'm a therapist and a researcher. And to me, both are ab about the art of asking questions. Where questions are the intervention. So then what are the right questions? They say science is about the hows and philosophy is about the whys. Now, to understand what I mean, can by a show of hands, how many of you have been around a three-year-old? Three-year-old? Thank you. So that's great you'll totally get what I'm about to say, and I keep pressing the wrong button. I have a three-year-old niece, and Amelia, and she's currently going through her why phase. Yeah, you remember this one. Auntie Nafisa, why is the sky blue? Auntie Nafisa, why do you have to go to work? Auntie Nafisa, why is that man chowing on the TV? So believe me when I say that I can't go through five seconds of doing anything without being asked why. But what I've only recently worked out is that she's actually ahead of the game. She's a philosopher. She's a researcher with an inquisitive mind, curious about everything in a world around her. She gets more about the world than I do at 32. All children are curious. And the only kind of color prejudice that they show is, I don't like eating green today. Because they don't care if you're black or white or if you're a woman or if you're purple or if you like men or if you like women, all they care about is 
do you have sweets? By the way, does, have, does anyone have chocolate? Because um, I'm kind of needing some right now. Psychology shows us that prejudice is not innate. We are not born with it. We are socialized and raised into it. The same way we are raised to stop being curious and asking too many questions. We are raised to accept things how they are and to get, just to get on with things. Pretty much 1984 and Big Brother. In a world where my three-year-old niece can get onto my phone, get onto my password, don't know how she knows it, get onto YouTube and watch her favorite show, it takes me 15 minutes to log onto my emails. I've got some work colleagues here. Shout out. Yay. Yep, it takes us 15 minutes to get to our emails. But the truth is, issues such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and any other form of oppression are not simple. There isn't a string theory or a eureka moment that goes, yes, I've got it. I've got it explained. I know what oppression is. We can't because oppression is never caused or maintained by a singular factor, which is why time and time again, we keep coming back to the same problems. Now, before I go any further, I'm gonna own up. I am a feminist, but no, I don't hate men. I kind of like them. But patriarchy and misogyny, not a fan. And I don't think people of color or white people are the problem either, racism is. And I don't think straight people are the problem. Homophobia is. Now, the thing all these issues have in common is the fact that they're just ideas. Bear with me. Patriarchy, sexism, racism. They're all just concepts. They are a way of seeing the world, feeling and being in the world. What people don't understand is that we're not fighting each other. That divide and conquer mentality is what's got us into this mess. We are fighting something much bigger. We are fighting ideas. And the only way to fight an idea is with better ones. And to spread these ideas through education, conversation, and TED Talks. What I've learned is that all oppression is connected. That, where am I? I've lost it, there we are. This is why you should memorize your speeches and never write one. All oppression is connected. That we have the power and potential to be both oppressed and oppressive. Remembering as Foucault said that where there is power, there is also resistance. And in a way in which we can come about understanding that complexity is through intersectionality. Now, like many theories, there's much debate about who created it, its meaning and its purpose, and, but all them debates, debates aside, all I can tell you is how I'm using it. Intersectionality is, well, was developed by thinkers such as Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins. It's basically the theory of how different oppressions link together. And the multi-nature of oppression that can be experienced by a singular person. But for me, it's about identity. And how the labels that we give ourselves, such as class, race, sexual orientation, age, creed, and gender ability, ability General ability, no ability. And how these classifications do not exist separately, but are interwoven together. There was a, spe a speaker earlier, and they were talking about weaving and the mills in Bradford, so I think it's quite important for today. Now, I want you to take a moment and to think about your own multiple identities. Here's some examples. Now, I'm a Muslim, and although this is my highest context, this is not my only one. I'm a proud Bradford-born Yorkshire lass of a Kashmiri heritage. Now, growing up in the time that I did, I really struggled with this. Like, what am I? Am I British? Am I Muslim? Am I Pakistani? Am I Kashmiri? Am I Indian? And I think many of us face this struggle within when trying to work out where is our place in the world. But what I've come to realize is that I am a Muslim and a Yorkshire lass, and Kashmiri, and a woman, and 32, and middle class, and have a working class mentality. And the list goes on. 
Now, whilst some of these identities are fixed, others such as age, thank God, will change, I will get older. However, simultaneously, I am all these things. As one identity cannot negate the other. As in, just because I'm from Yorkshire doesn't mean I'm not Kashmiri. And just because I'm a Muslim doesn't mean I can't respect the British values. Populism works on the basis of us and them, and is looking for the bad guy to blame. Therefore, a singular identity is a perfect target. For example, immigration. It's the problem, isn't it? That's why we're leaving Europe, supposedly. Now, I'm a third gener uh, generation, I can never say that word. I'm a third generation immigrant. So I wonder how many generations before I'm no longer an immigrant, or no longer the problem. And if immigration really was the greatest problem to society, why not just stop it? Because what they fail to mention is the economic, cultural, and other various benefits that it brings. Why else do you think Indian curries became the national dish? Which, uh, by the way, you are currently in the curry capital. I'm not sure if anyone's mentioned that today. So please do check out local cuisine. Whilst my point being, whilst singular labels in some ways can bring people together, from football to music gigs, where the only identity that matters is who you've come to support, to the holy pilgrimage of Hajj, on which Malcolm X described having his second epiphany in helping him overcome his own issues with identity and prejudice during the civil rights movement. In the words of Trevor Noah, Racism does not stand up to contact. Basically, it's really hard to hate people you've connected with. However, singular identities in other ways can be dehumanizing, reducing the complexity of the human experience to a singular. Like when you watch a movie and there's no depth to character and you don't even notice that they've been killed by a mass level extinction. Like, this is, I can't remember, Tomorrow? End of Tomorrow? Somebody know the movie of this title? Storm Takes Over the World. Day After Tomorrow, thank you very much to my introducer. Right, does anyone feel bad when one of these guys died? Does anyone cry, wipe a tear? No? Yeah, I didn't think so. However, when you get a character and you see their multiple identities and their struggles and understand where they've come from, you'll be moved to tears simply when they are lost. And even though the movie you're watching is about a fish and it's finding Nemo. This is the power of stories that Riz Ahmed discussed when addressing the House of Commons in the issue of, uh, on the issue of representation in 2017. So going back to the singular identities in politics, the stories that you he hear of a police officer killing another person or a terrorist stabbing someone, realize that these are the exceptions not the rules. I don't think there'd been anyone left on earth if there was. So, in conclusion, yes, we face systemic and social issues, such as racism and gender inequality and discrimination, which is being used by populist movements to further divide the world. All forms of oppression is everyone's problem. And only in uniting can we be changed. So remember that as social issues are complex, as are the people facing them. Don't let a singular label of yourself or others define your actions. Question. No, I can't get past it. Perhaps we can use intersectionality to see as a lens around the world. And maybe prevent the apocalypse. So finally, in the words of a very great man, I may not change the world, but I hope that I can inspire the mind that does. Tupac, I won't drop the mic, Imran, I promise. Thank you.